What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Stay True Podcast. I'm your host, Madison Pruitt Trout. I'm so excited you're here. Guys, this is crazy. I cannot believe this. We are on episode two of this podcast, and it still feels like a dream. This does not feel real. I am on cloud nine and literally living my dream. I have been, like I said last week, praying about this podcast for three years, and I cannot believe it's actually happening. And today I'm going to get real with you guys and I'm going to talk about something that I have been asked probably by thousands of people. And this is something that I've been waiting to do for a long time and excited that the time is finally now. So we are going to be having a conversation all around my experience on The Bachelor. So this is kind of part two of my story, you know, my experience going into The Bachelor and life since then. And this is going to be fun. This is going to be hard. I actually have never really talked about this before, especially publicly. Um, And so it'll be me navigating, like being vulnerable, as well as inviting you guys into some behind the scenes moments and things that happened on camera, off camera, and just my feelings and emotions through the whole process. So let's get into it. Okay. So I think I stopped last week's episode really talking about being in a season of singleness, living in Birmingham, Alabama, coming out of a four-year relationship and how hard that was for me. I was working in the foster care and adoption um, system and I was really having a hard time in the season that I was in, but trusting that God was preparing me for something. And I remember... I was leading this small group with a couple of friends and it was all on relationships. And throughout leading this small group, I kind of navigated through some different seasons myself, like homegirl was about to get engaged and then was dating and then went to being single. And I'm like, well, guys, I'm just trying to, you know, be authentic and help you guys as I'm navigating it myself. So that was an interesting time. But during this small group, two of my friends who I was really close to, um, was watching one week The Bachelor. And I come over, we're all hanging out, and they're all locked into the TV and watching something very intensely. And I'm like, guys, what's going on? What are you watching? And they were telling me The Bachelor. And I was like, guys, why are we watching The Bachelor? Like, we're not supposed to be watching The Bachelor. Like, Christians don't watch The Bachelor. (laughs) That's literally what I said, okay? The irony, the irony, the humor, it's fine, we're fine. And so I am like, why are you watching The Bachelor? I had never seen the show before. So I'm asking lots of questions. They're filling me in. They're telling me the tea. And I'm just not really interested. I'm like, guys, I'm not going to watch it. I don't really think we should be watching it. And they look at me and they were like, you should go on The Bachelor. Like you, you were made to go on The Bachelor. And I looked at them and I said, I will never go on The Bachelor. And I meant it like with every fiber in my being. I was like, I'm not going on The Bachelor. And they kind of giggled off in the corner and laughed to themselves. And I was just like, whatever. I left that night really not thinking anything about it, did not watch the show. And they ended up applying me without asking me and without my knowledge, they applied me to go on The Bachelor. That was in like January. And then in April, so months later, I am in the gym. I'm still working, you know, my job. I'm living my life. I'm navigating singleness. Um, I'm just a girl living in Birmingham, Alabama, working out at the gym. And I am on the treadmill and I get a call from a California number. And I remember being like, why is a California number calling me? I answer and they're like, hey, this is blank from ABC's The Bachelor you know, we're interested in having you on our show. And I remember being so confused. I thought it was a prank call. I thought someone was pranking me. I was like, I didn't apply for your show. And why are you asking me to come on it? I think you got the wrong girl. And she goes on and she's like telling me all these facts about myself. You know, we saw your application. You're 23 years old. You live in Birmingham, Alabama. You work for a foster care and adoption agency, like all these things. And I'm like, well, that is me. Okay, I'm a little confused. And I was like, I didn't apply to go on The Bachelor. And she was like, well, someone applied to you and we got the application and we, you know, would like for you to consider it. And I kind of laughed. Like, I really just still was like, no, I'm not even open to that. Like, that doesn't make, make any sense. I told her, I was like, I think you got the wrong girl. I just graduated from seminary. Your home girl was dating a youth pastor. Like, this doesn't even make sense. Like, why would I go on a reality TV dating show? 
And I remember just not taking it seriously, kind of laughing it off. And I hang up the phone. She's like, well, just, you know, she told me, she was like, just think about it and let us know, you know, if you're interested or not. And so I, I kind of, you know, passively hung up the phone, didn't think much, much about it, called my mom thinking this was going to be like a good old knee slapper moment. Like we're going to have a, a hoot and a holler talking about how the bachelor just called me and wants me to go on their show. I call my mom and I'm telling her I'm setting the scene and I'm like, you know, don't tell anyone, but I just got this call. I can't believe this, but I'm, you know, of course I'm not going to go on the show thinking, you know, my mom's going to be like, yeah, absolutely not. You're not going to go on that show. And instead she was like, well, have you prayed about it? And I was like, well, no, <laughs> I called you as soon as I got off the phone. What do you mean? And she was like, well, you know, we always pray first before we make any decisions, you know, in life, we take it to God and we pray first. And I was not expecting that response from my mom. And I was like, wow, I mean, that's, you know, that's wisdom, but it's the bachelor. Did you hear the show that I said? I didn't say Survivor, Mom. I said The Bachelor. <laughs> and she was like, hey, let's just pray about it. Like, it's an open door. They reached out to you. And let's just take it before God. Could be a absolutely no or it could be a yes. And so I was like, okay, I will pray about it. I hear my sister in the background, like running around, like you have to go on the show. Like I love the bachelor. And I was like, mom, I told you not to tell anyone. And she was like, yeah, I had you on speaker the whole time. And I remember getting off the call and just being like, okay, this is crazy, but God, I, I guess I'm going to take this before you and invite you into this decision-making process and just, you know, ask you, what's your will? Like, what do you want with this? Is this a no? Is this a maybe? Should I just keep going down that path? And for the next three months, my family and I took time to pray and fast and really seek God's heart and will in all of this. Like, God, what do you want with this? And over the course of those three months, I mean, y'all, the it, I, this it would take me an hour to three hours to tell you all of the signs, all of the like ways that God spoke through people, through nature. And it was so clear that that was the direction that God was leading me in. But it made no sense. Like everything that, you know, I've even gotten from people since coming off the show. Why would a Christian go on The Bachelor? Like, this doesn't make sense. I'm like, yeah, didn't to me either. <laughs> like, it made no sense to me either. And I'm sitting there like, God, this doesn't make sense. This is, this feels like a step in the wrong direction. This feels like a step backwards. Like, I'm ready to be a wife. I want to do full-time ministry. And going on a reality dating TV show where, you know, there's just been so many different depictions of faith and Christianity. And I, I just was like, that sounds terrifying to me. Like that sounds scary to me. And even as, you know, rumors were, you know, gossip was happening around town and people started finding out that, you know, I was going on the show. I had friends, like even some of the same friends that were in my corner supporting me, wanting to go on the show in the beginning. I had friends really turn their back on me and say, sorry, if you go on the show, we can't support you anymore. And that was a really hard season. Like I started feeling the weight of like what it would be like to go on this show and the level of feeling misunderstood, judged, and just had no idea how I would be portrayed. And so this was like not a light decision, you guys. Like I took three months to really like wore it out with God. <laughs> like I was like this, you got to pick a different person. I ain't the girl for the job. And I would say outside of even fearing other people and just the response that I would get, I was also terrified of if I even had what it took to stay true. Like, I mean, this podcast is called Stay True, but I didn't know if I had what it took to stay true. Like, you know, under so much pressure and temptation and being thrown into a situation that I never had before, like, God, can I stay true to my values? Will, will I be able to? And I was so scared. I really was. I was really scared. And at the same time, continued to feel so much peace, so much peace and really felt God speak to me through dreams and people. And like I said, nature in a way that I couldn't run from, like I couldn't deny it. And it felt to everyone who was involved in this prayer process with me, I had my best friend and I had my family. I didn't tell anyone else outside of that because I knew inviting a ton of other opinions, you know, would be maybe not that helpful in making this decision if I felt like this is where God was leading me. And so 
I remember having this moment of just God, like, I need you to make this so clear. And I was praying. I was actually at my church. Um, my church was going through this thing called 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I remember being like at the front of the church, literally at the altar, like shaking and crying and being like, God, I don't think I'm the person for this. Like, I don't know if I can do this. I'm scared. And I just had all of these what ifs, like, what if I get rejected? What if I, what if I misunderstood? What if people, you know, think of me as a bad person or a bad Christian and I misrepresent you? What if I can't stay true? And I just started asking all of these what ifs. And I just kept saying, like, I don't feel strong enough for this, Lord. Like, I don't feel like I have what it takes to stay true. I don't feel like I have what it takes to stand firm. And I remember having this moment, just crying to the Lord, and praying. And there are other people in this room, like there were other people at the church where we were all praying, you know, for this 21 days of prayer and fasting. And the campus pastor at the time, in the middle of this prayer, in the middle of me crying, he had no idea, y'all, that this was a decision that I was thinking about or praying about or considering at all. And I remember halfway through that prayer, me just being like, God, you're going to have to show me. You're going to have to tell me. You're going to have to make it clear. I don't feel like I can do this. I'm like finishing that prayer. And as I'm saying that, I literally feel like an arm on my shoulder and just someone like kind of whispering in my ear, like God told me to come tell you, you can do this. And he has prepared you for such a time as this. You have what it takes to stay true. You have what it takes to stand firm and you're going to have to trust him. And I was like, what? This is crazy. Like every single thing I was telling God, I don't feel like I can do this. Like, what if this, what if that he, this, he was spe speaking directly to that. And I remember having that moment of like, okay, God, you y'all, my stomach just <laughs> growled so loud. Oh my gosh. Clearly I'm hungry. But I remember having that moment being like, God, you see me, you hear me. And if you were calling me to this, like you will sustain me through it. Like if you're calling me to it, you'll sustain me through it. If you're bringing me to it, like you'll, you'll protect me through it. I got to trust you if this is the way you're leading me. And just again and again and again, like he would make it so clear. This is where I'm leading you, Maddie. You just have to trust me. And I understood the weight of that. Like I understood I am setting myself up to be judged, not only by the world, but by Christians. Like I'm setting myself up to be misunderstood, not only by the world, but by Christians. But I knew at the end of the day, I live for an audience of one. And at the end of the day, I have to give an account for my decisions, for my obedience. And when I am one day face to face with God, like I don't want to look at him and be like, sorry, I didn't obey you. I was terrified of what other people would think about me. I wanted to be like, hey, I followed you, whatever the cost. I was willing to obey you, whatever the cost. And I want to hear the words, good job, my good and faithful servant. I am so proud of you. And at that time, like I, with everything in me, had full peace and full faith that that was the direction God was leading me in, even though I didn't understand. And it was a weighty decision. And I remember preparing for it. I'm getting ready. I'm packing. I'm like, how do you even pack for something like this? They told me I could take one suitcase. Your, your girl had three. And I was like, I don't know what to wear. I don't know how to prepare. And I just was praying to God that I had what it took to stand firm. And I also didn't know what I was getting myself into. Like I said, I had never really watched the show before. And once I said yes and committed to going on the show, of course, I started kind of looking into some things, trying to learn about you know, the bachelor, what am I about to step into? And I, you know, remember learning like, okay, this is something where I could show up and get sent home immediately. Or this is something where it could be the next two months or so of my life of filming. And that was hard, scary, awesome, exciting, all the feelings. And I remember I leave for California because you start off in California. So I fly out to California, I get there. I, you know, meet the producers and, and everyone, but I, I hadn't met any of the girls yet. So I haven't met anyone, haven't met The Bachelor, haven't met the girls yet. I get there, I'm taken to my room and I'm just like journaling. I'm like, Lord, what do we, I mean, I'm here. I committed, <laughs> we're in this, like, we got this. Okay, like, let's do it. And I was so nervous, y'all. I was so nervous. And the day that I was going on the show, like going to meet The Bachelor, filming was starting, all the other girls were riding in limos together. And I was 
by myself. I was in a limo by myself. I don't really know why. I don't know if there was something to that or if it was just my particular entrance because everyone, you know, has the different entrances or whatever when they get on the show. And mine was, it was so cheesy. I look back and I cringe at myself. And I was cringing at myself, honestly, as I was doing it. But I was like, at this point, we're going to full send. I had a couple of ideas of what I wanted to do originally, and it just didn't work out. So we ended up literally creating a massive paper airplane. I put myself into it, and I flew up acting like I was a pilot. I told y'all it was cheesy. I don't even remember my pickup line. I don't know what I said. I blacked out. It was crazy. My heart was racing, and the whole time I just was like, don't fall on your face. (laughs) Like, don't fall on your face. But I had sneakers on, so, you know. We were fine. And I get there, meet him. I get in the room. I see all the girls and I just was beyond overwhelmed, but again, felt such tangible peace and felt, okay, the Lord is with me. And I just have to continue to trust him and lean on him through this entire process. I didn't come in with a lot of expectations. I didn't really you know, come in thinking, cause that's a question I get asked often is like, you know, did you really think you were going to find your husband on the bachelor? Did you really think, you know, a person like you who was saving herself for marriage and who was a Christian, you know, coming on a reality dating secular show? Like, did you really expect to find your spouse? I didn't know what I expected. I really didn't have expectations. I just was taking a step of faith. Like, I did not know how it was going to turn out. I didn't know if I would get sent home the first week. I didn't know if I was there to learn a life lesson. I didn't know if I was there to build my faith. I didn't know if I was there for the girls to just encourage and love on them or if I was there for the bachelor or if that was my spouse. I had no idea. I just was like, okay, God, I feel led to do this and we're going to do it. We're going to go for it. And so even getting there and meeting him and then getting the first one-on-one date. I mean, just the whole process was so crazy. And I remember being like, okay, on this first one-on-one date, wow, this is legit. Like, okay, there's some feelings starting to brew. This is, this is wild. I'm dating this guy who's also dating these 30 other girls. (laughs) Like what in the world is happening? And every day I would say truly was a battle for me. Like it was, it was tough. Like I was, because we're mic'd up, there's cameras on us 24 seven. You're not just like, you don't have your phones. I don't have my family to call or talk to. So it's not like I'm, you know, getting advice from my mom or my dad or my friends, or I'm, you know, being able, I'm able to go to church on Sunday and just worship my way through it. Like I'm, I'm at the bachelor mansion. I'm, I am on my own and I don't really have alone time. And so the only time that I really had but to myself was I would lock myself in the bathroom. I would take my Bible with me and I would just read and pray. And then I would just journal. Like even if I was being recorded or filmed or whatever, I would just, you know, be journaling in different places of the mansion and just asking God, like, give me strength, help me to stay true, help me to stand firm in my values and my convictions, you know, and to love you and to love people well and I trust you. And I just kept saying those things again and again, because it was definitely such a weird concept that all of these girls that I'm starting to get close to and, you know, confide in, in a way are all trying to date the same guy that I'm trying to date. So it was very interesting, but there were definitely some really sweet moments behind the scenes with some of the girls and encouraging each other and praying for each other. I remember having this one moment with one of the girls and just looking at her and saying she was feeling really nervous and insecure about one of the rose ceremonies. And I remember telling her, I was like, Hey, your worth is not found in this rose. Your worth is not found in his ability to see you for who you truly are. Your worth and value is in something so much bigger than you. It's in how God sees you and it's in who God says you are. And I would remind myself of that. Like Maddie, if you don't get a rose, okay, this is not rejection. This is just redirection to something better because your worth is not found in this rose. Your worth is not found in this show. Your worth is not found in how the bachelor sees you or how people perceive you on TV. Your worth and value is in something so much bigger than you. And I would have to remind myself of that often, but we would encourage each other. You know, there were, there were definitely some drama moments. Absolutely. But we also would encourage each other and remind each other, you know, of the bigger picture because it's so easy to get really caught up in all of it when every single day for basically since you wake up, like you wake up in the morning, there's 
cameras on you immediately. Like there was even one morning I remember we were woken up by the producers and I had pimple patches on my face, literally pimple patches all over my face. And we were brought downstairs for like some, I don't even know, date card or something. And we were in pajamas, pimple patches, like I hadn't even brushed my teeth yet. And so there were definitely moments where you wake up and it's immediate into filming and you don't have the time to really, you know, feel your best or take time to figure out all the things you're just kind of thrown into it and you're filmed 24 seven. Those rose ceremonies literally go to like five or six in the morning. And so you are exhausted. You're so tired. And at the same time, you're trying to navigate your feelings. You're trying to navigate, you know, not only how do I feel about this person, but what do I value and what do I need in a relationship? Like that was something I had to continue to remind myself of. It's not just, does he choose me, but do I choose him? You know, all throughout the time of filming, I'm like, yeah, I may be on some show called the bachelor where it's all about the bachelor, but I know who I am in Christ. I know my value. I know my worth. And whether he chooses me or not, like I have to answer the question of, do I choose him? Is he the one God's chosen for me? And so throughout the time of filming, I'm constantly, I mean, I'm journaling, I'm praying. And I remember when we got to, I think it was, oh gosh, I'm like my memory. I think it was Costa Rica and I was having a hard moment and I kind of, you know, snuck away for a second and just like sat outside and started journaling. And I was like, God, my, there's a tension between my head and my heart right now. And like my head knows, you know, what the, the man that you've called me to be with and that I need a man that is, you know, that fears you and loves you and serves you and can lead me and, you know, pursues purity and all of these things. But I also am having strong feelings for this person. And so I felt like my head and my heart were in this tension. And that really stayed throughout the entire time of filming. Like, it was crazy. But there were also just some really fun and funny moments, too. Like, I remember when we got to Costa Rica, actually, our luggage got lost. And so the first, like, two or three days of filming... We were in our travel clothes and we did not have makeup. We did not have, well, some people did if they like put it in their backpack, I guess, on the plane. But I did not have makeup. I did not have undergarments. I did not have my toothbrush and toothpaste. I mean, we were like on the struggle bus for a couple of days while being filmed on <laughs> national TV. And I remember being like, this is so funny. Like, I just can't even, this is when I'm like, well, I can't put my worth and value in what I look like and in, you know, what I can dress like what my clothes are and all of those things like I'm roughing it and I just got to be okay with that so there were multiple moments where the girls and I I'm still close with a lot of the girls and we'll still you know kind of talk about some of the funny moments from the show um I remember my second one-on-one -on -one date with uh with him was we were in I think Peru and I had to eat fish heart y'all it was the most disgusting thing ever we were on this boat and it was all about, I don't even remember how the scene got set up, but it was like all about, you know, are you, is your heart all in? If you are like, you know, let's eat this fish heart together. I don't know. It was crazy. It was disgusting. And just so many moments like that where I don't know, it just was, it was fun. It was funny. I also remember this one time, this was back in, I think Ohio, this was before we left for international and one of the group dates, this is like my dream, like, just day of we went to the Browns the NFL team the stadium and we were some of the players were there we were getting coached by them and then we were going to play each other like we were going to scrimmage each other the girls not the, not with the professional players the girls were going to scrimmage each other and I was like my competitive heart is coming alive right now I mean I was thriving and so I was so excited about this group date as soon as we found out what it was but I woke up for this group date y'all with the biggest pimple on my face that you have ever seen in your life. Like it was like a face on my face, you know, it had taken a life of its own and it was humiliating. And I remember just being like, every time I was talking to people or being filmed, I just like had my hand over my face, trying to cover it as much as possible. And I remember some of the girls, they were like trying to encourage me. They were like, Maddie, you know, it's about what's on the inside. And I was like, okay, yes. But just tell me like it is, how bad is the pimple? And one girl was like, I'm not going to lie to you. It's pretty rough. But the good news is you'll have a helmet on and hopefully that sucker will be covered. So thankfully it was. But then as soon as the, the game, you know, quote unquote ended, we actually ended in a tie. 
And this is like my worst nightmare. I do not do well with ties. I'm like, there is a winner or there is a loser. <laughs> There's not a tie. And the game ended. We're in the locker room and I'm like ticked off and I'm sweaty. My hair's up in a bun. And there you see it, just a big old pimple. And then you want to know something really embarrassing, which this is just like, you know, you got to embrace it now. But when the show was actually airing and the, the Bachelor just did me dirty for this because the show was airing and this episode was coming out and I had a picture that you know someone had taken of us and it was of me and one of my friends Sydney and we we were like posed up you know in our our football uniform and there you see it just this massive pimple on my chin so I was like well before I post it I'm clearly obviously going to erase this pimple off my face because it's humiliating and so I photoshopped that sucker off my face I posted it. I'm not kidding. An hour later, The Bachelor posted the same photo with the pimple on my face. And it just was people were going off on social media. It was like, oh, Madison, you know, photoshopped a pimple off her face. And I'm like, yeah, I did. I photoshopped it off my face because you don't want to see it. I didn't want to see it. It was ugly. It wasn't cute. But it was also so embarrassing. I was like, yeah, I just got called out. And from that day forward, I was like, I'm never photoshopping anything ever again. That was like God just trying to teach me a lesson of just embrace, embrace the things, embrace the flaws, embrace the weaknesses. Like, don't pretend like it's not there. Just embrace it. So that was, you know, another funny moment. And there were a lot of those in the midst of the craziness, in the midst of the drama, in the midst of the really hard things, you know, I remember having to have some of those harder conversations and leading up to, you know, even really talking about my purity on national television and having to tell, you know, The Bachelor, but also knowing, wow, millions of people are going to be watching this also. And my words matter, like how I explain, you know, what purity means to me and why I've decided to make this decision I knew would come with levels of criticism and judgment and, being misunderstood and accusations and all kinds of different things. But I knew that I, I had to, I knew that I should. Um, and it was who I was. If I'm staying true, I got to speak the truth. I have to be me. I have to, you know, share my story, my experiences, as well as my values and my beliefs and my convictions. And so I remember, you know, sharing those things and it being met with some opposition and, uh, yeah, that was really tough. That was really tough, you know, leading into the last probably few weeks of the show were for sure the hardest for me, you know, coming back from hometowns. Now I'm really, you know, in this relationship, I just got a taste of seeing my family for like a split second, but I didn't get to really, I didn't have any moments with them off camera. And so I wanted to know, like, what do you really think? Like, what do you, what do you, what do you really feel? You know? And that was really hard. Like not getting that time with them being in my hometown, but not getting to really see my friends, talk to my friends. Um, it was really tough. Like I'm someone who really values wise counsel. I'm someone who really values, you know, the opinions of my family and, you know, involving church and pastors and what do y'all think about it? And I'm in this position where I'm having to make some really weighty decisions and have some really weighty conversations with a lot of pressures and a lot of, you know, heightened emotion, praying that I'm saying it in a way that, you know, is, is true. And in a way that is honest and vulnerable, but also in a way that, you know, hopefully can be received. And so, those conversations were really tough. Um, the last couple of weeks in Australia were really hard. It was not, you know, people also ask all the time, like, are you getting to go and explore and have fun in the city or the town or the country that you're in? No, no. You're exploring when you're on camera. <laughs> you're exploring and you're having fun when you're on camera. And then everything off, you know, you're either in interviews or, you know, you're just having conversations to like prepare for the next day. But it's, yeah, you're mainly in interviews. And so you're constantly being filmed um, or, you know, once you get to that point, you know, the last couple of weeks, you have more alone time. So I was getting more alone time. I was able to read more. I was able to pray more. But I remember, you know, in one of the final weeks, I think it was the week before engagement when I had learned that, you know, The Bachelor had been intimate with one or both of the other, you know, people. I was so heartbroken. I was so upset and I locked myself in the bathroom <laughs> and I cried for hours. I don't think that was shown, but I locked myself in the bathroom. I'm being told to come out, but I am just like, I don't think I can do this anymore. I was crying out to God and I was like, God, I just, I need you to lead me. I need you to show me, you know, like this is, 
this is not what I've pictured for my future spouse. And there are so many questions that I have, but at the same time, I do have these feelings for him. And, you know, what do I do with that? What do I do with all of that? <clears throat> Crazy thing is I actually have my journal right here. This is y'all. This is the journal that I took with me on the bachelor. Every single page is filled out from filming the show to the show being aired, coming off the show. I mean, the whole journey. And it is, listen, there's some tea in this thing. There's some emotion in this thing. I have had every feeling possible. And let me see if I can even find like a page that is worthy of reading of how truly like how I felt towards like the end of, of filming. And then I want to get into like airing because that was a whole nother experience in and of itself. Uh, the good and the bad that came with that. This was in November. We started filming in September. So this is like drawing near the very end of filming. And I wrote this down and I'm like crying. There's probably some like dried up tear marks on this page. I said, I am drowning in all of this. I have never known loneliness like this. I feel like I'm unable to think on my own. I'm unable to surround myself with people that I know I can for sure trust. I'm slowly losing my sanity. I feel helpless. Like no matter what happens in this situation, I lose. I'm just like going on and on and on about like, what am I doing? God, I pray you're with me. I don't know what's happening. And I'm like crying because this was one of the biggest tests of my faith ever. And just when you're in an environment where there, there are so many voices, there's so many pressures, there's so many temptations you even begin to question yourself, you know, and I have to remind myself again and again, like there's some journal entries in here where I'm just like, who is Maddie question mark. And then I have a whole page of just like, this is who God says she is. This is her heart. This is her wiring. This is, and I had to remind myself of that constantly. I'd have another page. Who is God? This is who God says he is. This is who God's been to me my whole life. This is how God changed my life. And I would have to remind myself again and again. And I encourage anybody listening, like that's something I would encourage you to do whenever you find yourself in a season of tension and a season of pressure and a season of hardship, asking yourself, reminding of your, reminding yourself, like this is who God is. This is who you are in Christ. You are a new creation. You know, God loves you. You are his masterpiece. You are set apart. You were chosen. You were accepted. You are loved. And I had to remind myself of that constantly. And so that was really my experience filming. And, you know, I ended up breaking up with uh, breaking up with him in, I think it was a day or two before the engagement, ultimately because I realized, you know, our values are different. We're not on the same page. We don't want the same things. I don't think we're God's best for each other. And I remember the breakup scene being so crazy because it was like a hundred and something degrees in the middle of like this desert in Australia. Y'all, I don't know if it looked cute on the TV. It was not cute in real life. It was hot. I was sweating. I put on self tanner. I was sweating my self tanner off. Like I go back, I went back and before filming this uh, podcast, I went and watched some of the scenes because I hadn't watched it since the show came out. And I was like, that was not cute. Wow. They, they should have told me. They should have told me I did not look cute in those moments. And there were flies everywhere. Like there were mosquito flies, whatever you call them, everywhere. Like they were just, if you go back and look at that scene, we are constantly swatting away flies. It was a hot mess. And in the midst of that, a breakup. So talk about a crazy breakup. You're on national TV. You're in the middle of Australia in a desert. You're sweating your tanner off and you are swatting away mosquitoes. I mean, what a time to be alive. And I walked away from that breakup. Definitely sad. Definitely, you know, yeah, just like, wow, I'm really sad to end this relationship. But at the same time, I know that was the decision that I needed to make. Like I had no doubt in my mind that that was the decision that I needed to make. And I honestly, in a way, felt really relieved. I felt like, whew, okay, I feel like I've been in war. I feel like I've been in a crazy place for a very long time, and I'm just ready to get back to my people. I'm ready to get back in church. I'm ready to just be around people that I know are for me and I trust and I love. And so I was ready to get back home. We ended up, I stayed there for another week because I had to wait for the whole show to like stop filming before I got back home. But I remember my, you know, my parents picking me up and I'd actually on the plane because the flight was like, I don't know, crazy, like 16 hours or something. 
And on the flight, I wrote down, I literally went through every week, like week one, week two, week three, week four, like every single week with being on the show because I wanted to tell my family every detail of what happened. So it was like pages and pages. And I got in the car. I'm weeping with my family. It was like the greatest, you know, reuniting, embracing moment. And when we got in the car, I just started telling them everything that happened. And they're like on the edge of their seat. They couldn't believe it. And then months pass by because the final episode comes out or like the final, the finale or whatever it's called is actually live. And so months passed by before I was filming again, I guess, in a way. And so those next couple of months, like I just went back to normal life. I'm with my family. I'm with my friends. Everything's great. I am getting pretty anxious with, you know, the show coming out. I have no idea. You don't get to see it before. I don't know if people are aware of that or not. I don't see any of the episodes before. I see it when everybody else sees it. So there definitely was some anxiety of like, you know, I basically signed up for being able to be portrayed however they want to portray me. And so... I don't know how this is going to go. I don't know how I'm going to look and I don't know how people are going to respond, but I have faith and trust and know that I made the decisions that I knew that I should make. And was I perfect? Absolutely not. If I could go back and maybe change some things, probably people ask me all the time, like, do you regret anything on the show? You know, would you, would you change anything? And I'm like, yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, but at the time being in it with just all the pressures and all the things, you know, I really made the decisions that I knew best to make in those moments. Um, and so I give myself grace at the same time. I've learned a ton through it and of course probably could have handled things better, but we probably could say that about, I don't know, every season of our life, if we're honest. And so we're constantly growing and learning. I learned a lot through filming for sure. And then airing starts, right? Okay. So it's like, I don't even remember the exact date. I think like January 10th or something. So a couple months had passed by, I remember having all of my closest friends come over to my house and I'm like, okay, guys, it goes live tonight. Like, whew, okay, we got to pray. We got to pray. And we all got in a room, we prayed and we turned on the show and I am seeing all of this for the first time. Like I'm seeing them, you know how there's like the, I think they still do this. I, I have not seen the bachelor since the show. <laughs> I'll be honest. I yeah. Walked away from all that. And I was like, I'm good to, to not watch it. And so I have not seen it since then, um, since going on the show, but so I don't know if they still do this, but when I was on it, they did the like 10, 15 girls that they highlighted at the very beginning where they would like show you kind of like, a introduction into these girls and their lives. And so I'm like watching this and I'm seeing me and my dad, like playing basketball in the basketball court and just like it all come together. And I'm like, this is so crazy. This is so wild. And I remember I had walked into that night, I think with probably 8,000 followers and living a pretty anonymous life. Like my life had always been anonymous. I was a small town girl uh, living in Alabama. And now by the end of episode one, because I got the first one-on-one -on -one date, I went from 8,000 followers to 250,000 followers. And in that moment, I feel anxiety like I've never felt before in my life and it wasn't even like people were very kind people were very loving and very kind of just my values uh, my country accent my family I mean everyone was very kind but I remember having to literally walk away halfway through the episode I I went and you know shut the door I'm in the bathroom my friends are still in there watching and I just cried and my heart was literally like boop, 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 just like so anxious but I was like okay God I just trust like you are my defender you are my protector all of this is in your hands you know I did it it's over and I just trust you with the rest and I you know the the episode one ended my life was now different there were now magazine articles about who is Madison Pruitt and what is she like you know take a quiz see if you're like Madison Pruitt or Hannah Ann or and then named a few other girls just like the weirdest thing you know these celebrities that I had been following for so long posting you know about me and people making comments just about everything you know people are making comments about your looks people are making comments about your family people are making comments about you know your values and I would say throughout all of airing that was a constant realization that I had to have was like okay to everyone else like this is just entertainment this is just a tv show but 
this is my life. Like this is, this is me. Like I have to like live with this. And I realized how careless people are with their words. I realized how quickly people can judge and put their opinions out there, good and bad. You know, I love this girl. She should win the whole thing all the way to, you know, F this girl. She's the worst. I hate her. She's ugly. She shouldn't be on this show. I got both, you know, I got the praise and I got the criticism. And I realized the only way I'm going to be able to, you know, keep my sanity and also remember who I am and live a life for an audience of one and look to please God and not please people as if I remind myself and choose to not listen to the praise or the criticism. But if I choose to just remind myself of this is what my family thinks about me, this is what my close friends think about me, and this is what God thinks about me. So this is what I'm going to choose to think about me because that ultimately is what matters. So I just encourage anybody listening to this, like a Bible verse that has really helped me since that moment of coming off the show. And even today, I'm so easy. I so easily fall into like people pleasing and wanting people to like me, wanting people to accept me. And I've had to remind myself of Galatians 1.10, where it basically says you cannot please God and people. Like if you choose to live for the approval of people, you are not a servant of Christ. That's, of course, me paraphrasing that a little bit, but it's a really good reminder. I cannot please God and please people. And so I had to remind myself of that often, you know, in coming off of the show and in getting all the opinions and in getting all of the feedback. And like I said, a lot of it was good and a lot of it was not kind. And you just had to filter through it all. What was helpful for me is I honestly didn't really get on social media a ton. I didn't read the comments. I didn't really read many of the DMs until my heart was at a place where I could handle it. Like until I was at a place where I felt healed um, and, and wasn't in a super vulnerable spot. And that took a while to get there. I had really bad anxiety. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I ended up losing over 20 pounds in kind of that February, March time frame, kind of towards the ending of the the season being aired. And when I got swooped back into all of it and, you know, came into the finale, I remember people even commenting on the way that I looked, you know, Madison has lost a lot of weight. She looks unhealthy. She doesn't even look like herself, you know, making all these comments about my appearance and how I look so different. And truth be told, like I did, I totally looked different because the anxiety had weighed on me so heavy. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. And so I was losing so much weight. I came into the finale. Oh, terrified. (laughs) So terrified. And, you know, we were not back together, which I think is maybe how it was portrayed. But we had decided to come back into the finale from a place of let's figure this out. You know, can this work? Is there a chance, you know, at this working And even just having conversations off camera, like we want to be able to have conversations off camera. And so we were both open to having that came into the finale with that mindset. For those who saw the finale, we don't have to get into all that. (laughs) We'll leave it there. It was crazy. It was wild. Uh, It was a time. And I walked off the stage very dramatic. When I tell you dramatic, that is putting it lightly. I was so blindsided and hurt by what I felt was an attack that I like walked off stage. I took off my headset. I took off my like mic and I threw it down. I ran to the bathroom and I was like, you know, so angry at everyone. I locked the door. I cried. And I just remember all I wanted to do was like call my mom. Like all I wanted to do was call my mom. And I didn't have my phone. I didn't have access to anything. And I'm crying in the bathroom. And I just, I remember she had told me this, this like phrase right before I went on the finale. And she just said, you're stronger than you think you are. Remember who you are. And that was going through my mind again and again. I'm sitting in this bathroom. I'm crying. And I'm just like, (laughs) now that I'm saying this, I'm like, man, bathrooms have really been a sanctuary for me, I guess. (laughs) I'm like in every traumatic moment in my life, somehow I flooded to the bathroom. But yeah, I'm sitting in the bathroom It really because in this moment, it was like the only place I felt like there I was safe to not be filmed, you know, that there wouldn't be cameras around that I could lock the door and get away from everyone. And so I'm crying and I'm just replaying again and again, you're stronger than you think you are. Remember who you are, Maddie, and reminding myself of that because I felt blindsided and I felt hurt and confused and like I couldn't trust anyone. And I also forgot to say this, but because I wasn't able to talk to my family throughout the time of filming on the show, 
my mom actually sent me with 41 letters. So she gave me, she had written me like these letters for every single day that I was there. She didn't know how long I would be there, but she felt like God was like, write 41 letters. She just felt the number 41 on her heart. And the craziest thing ever is that those 41 letters carried me exactly like to the date to hometowns for 41 days. That was like 41 days leading up to hometowns. And then it was like, from there, it almost felt like she was just like, go like, you've got this, you know, fly <laughs> like an, like an Eagle, an Eagle mama says to her little eaglet, you know, like I've, I have nurtured you. I have, you know, encouraged you. I've challenged you. I've affirmed you. And now you just need to, you just need to trust that what's inside of you will carry you through that, that the Lord's got you. And so those 41 letters got me, you know, through filming, but even through this moment, like my mom, I have a very close relationship with my mom and her words just really stuck out to me. And I'm just clinging to those in that moment. You know, I finally, you know, leave that whole scene and I'm, kind of back in just everyday life, you know, we ended up after the airing finished, you know, we ended up having hard conversations, the bachelor and I, and just decided, Hey, yeah, this is not going to work. You know, we have very different viewpoints and values on faith, on purity, on love, on, you know, life on everything really. And so this is just not going to work out. We wish you the best. And it was both a very mutual decision. And so I'm really thankful that that ended well. And, you know, I wanted the best for him, still want the best for him. It ended well and still really after filming and airing, like still had and maintained good relationships with all the girls. A lot of them came to my wedding. A lot of them were at my wedding, which was super fun. I remember like, you know, jumping up and down on the dance floor and <laughs> we're, we're like, I'm married, you know, and they were all just so happy for me. And so supportive. And so I've still kept, you know, good relationships with all of them, which I'm really grateful for, because I don't know that that's everyone's story. But I came off the show and I was like, wow, okay, my whole life is different. I now have these opportunities, people were reaching out, you know, asking me to come and speak at their church, you know, like I saw you stand firm in your faith, I saw you stand firm in your purity. And I think you should come and speak to our youth. I think you should come and speak to our college students. And I just was like, wow, what what is what is life? What is my life? And I was like, okay, God, maybe this was all for something. Maybe you used this story. Maybe you used my yes to lead to other people's step of faith. And that was all I could hope for. And as I started getting more comfortable with, you know, reading some of the DMs and going back and, you know, looking at some of the things that people were saying, what was crazy was actually before filming this podcast, went back and read some of the like tweets and some of the DMs because I had screenshotted them and saved a bunch of them because I knew at some point, like, I want to be reminded of just these moments and these memories and, uh, you know, what, what people were saying, what people were feeling. And so many people, literally countless tweets were like, thank you for staying true. You're, you're giving me the courage to do the same. And I'm like, what? I didn't even think about that y'all when I came up with this name for this podcast. And so seeing those messages of like, thank you for staying true. It's given me the confidence, the courage, you know, the hope to do the same was wild. It was so crazy. And so I know God used it. And I would even encourage those listening, like God wants to use you. God wants to use your story. Your story doesn't have to look like mine. I, in fact, I hope it doesn't because this has been a really hard journey and coming off the show was not easy. I had a lot to work through. I had a lot of trust issues. I had a lot to navigate and now my life being very different than what it was before dealing with lots of judgments, dealing with lots of being, you know, misunderstood. And even now in like the Christian church world, when I was a church girl, like I was a girl who grew up in the church my whole life and had gone through seminary and loved Jesus with all of her heart. And now even with the church, I was receiving a lot of judgment, a lot of the church being like, we don't support you. We're not behind you. Um, you know, you chose to go on the bachelor, like, so we can't support you and a lot of judgment even in the church. Um, and so that was really tough for me and hard for me to, to feel like I could open up to people and like, I could really share this story. Um, and this has been something that I've been scared to talk about even since then. Like I've been scared to even open up, you know, um, on my platforms about my experience with the bachelor, because it was, it was amazing. And I learned so much and I'm so grateful. I don't regret going on the show there. I do not regret going on the show. I get asked that a lot. 
Um, I don't regret going on the show. Was it extremely hard? Yes. Was it the biggest test of my faith? Yes. Has it changed my life forever in many ways? Yes. Um, but I also learned so much. My faith grew deeper and stronger. I am more dependent on the Lord now than I ever have been. I learned to never judge people because receiving judgment and being the one judged was not fun and very hard. And so now I don't judge people. I give people the benefit of the doubt until they prove otherwise. Um, and I learned a lot. And what I would encourage and just challenge you guys with, because no matter the season of life you're in, no matter your situation, no matter your circumstances, you know, you may not be in a, a bachelor pressure filled, you know, moment, but you still face pressures. And even though it may look different on the outside, our stories may look different on the outside. It still leaves the same feelings on the inside. It still leaves the same feelings of, I want to be liked. I want to be accepted. I want to belong. I want to fit in. You know, I, I don't want to be rejected. I don't want to be judged. Um, you know, I want to, I want to honor God. I want to live a life that makes a difference, right? Like we all have those feelings. We want to be loved. We want to be seen. We want to live a life of significance. And some of the ways that I was, and I did not stay true perfectly. There were a lot of moments, like I said, um, you know, would I go back and change? Probably there were probably some moments I'd go back and change, but I would say for the most part, you know, the way that I was able to stay true to my values, to my purity, to my convictions in the midst of temptation and pressure, um, one is because I knew my why. And so I would encourage you know your why, why are you standing firm? Why are you staying true for me? I live for an audience of one. I know that Matthew five, eight says, blessed are those who are pure in heart for they will see God. I want to see God. I want to know God. I want to please God. I want to honor God. God is pure. God is holy. Therefore, I want to be pure and holy. That was my why. That was my why in staying true to my purity. You know, what, what was, what's my why for, you know, not gossiping and not getting drunk on the show and not doing all of these things. You know, it's like, well, my why is to honor God with my mouth. I don't want to speak against his children, his very creation. I, you know, I don't want to get drunk. I'm called to stay sober minded. I'm called to, you know, live a life of, of holiness, not just in my you know, with my purity and when it comes to sex, but I'm called to live a life of holiness and purity when it comes to my mind, when it comes to my mouth, those were my whys. And so my encouragement to you would be when it comes to, you know, standing firm in your values and your boundaries and, you know, when pressures hit, when temptations come, you got to know your why. If you don't know your why, you will lose your way because your why helps you stand firm in your life. It helps you choose, you know, the path and make the decisions that are in line with your values that are in line with your beliefs. And so you got to know your why. And then I would say in line with that second thing is pre-decide, pre-decide who you're going to be and what you believe before the temptations and the pressures come. Th those pre-decision moments are so important because when you're in the heat of the moment, I promise you, your feelings will be telling you all sorts of things. Like, in so many different ways and so many different temptations, your feelings will try and lead you down a direction. And then you might end up down a path of regret, of resentment, of saying, how did I get here? And my hope and encouragement for you and what I challenge myself, what I've challenged my friends with, and what I hope to challenge my children with one day is you got to pre-decide before the heat of the moment, who you're going to be and what you believe so that when those moments of pressure come, what's inside of you will come out of you. And you want that to be something you can be proud of. You want that to be something you can say, yes, thank you. I'm so glad that I made that decision. I know it was a hard decision. I know it wasn't a popular decision. I know other people didn't understand it, but I lay my head down at night and that was me. Like I made some decisions that were not popular and that were really hard, but I could lay my head down at night on my pillow and say, I stayed true to who I was. I stayed true to what I believe. I stayed true to the truth. And I'm grateful for that. And like I said, hey, that might not have been your story up until this point. That's all right. That hasn't always been my story. And there's not judgment. But my encouragement would be in order for you to be all that God has called you to be, in order for you to be the person that you can be proud of, you've got to make the decision in advance. You've got to pre-decide in advance so that when those moments of pressure and temptation come, you already know what you're going to do. And honestly, I started that practice long before I went on The Bachelor. I was doing that in college. Like freshman year of college, I was like, hey, I'm going to be in a room 
alone with a cute boy. And I want to know how I'm going to respond. I'm going to be at a party where people are doing this, 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 and this. And I want to know how I'm going to respond. And so I made those decisions in advance. Okay, Maddie, when this moment comes, this is how you're going to respond. This is what you're going to do. Because my encouragement to you would be, we need to be people who respond and not react. We don't need to just react off of what we feel, but we need to respond based off of our convictions and our values. Because at the end of the day, our feelings are valid, but they're not always right. And they're not always trustworthy. And they don't always make good leaders. Our feelings are just indicators. Our feelings point to something much deeper that's going on inside. Our feelings point to where we feel lack. Our feelings point to where we feel abundance. And so they're just indicators. They don't make good leaders. And so you have to ask yourself, what do I believe? What do I value? What's true to my wiring and to, you know, for me, like the, the word of God is, is how I make all of my decisions. And then I have people of God, people who believe the same thing that I believe, you know, come alongside of me and help me stay accountable to those things. Like who hold me accountable to stay true to those things. Because sometimes there's blind spots. Like we can't always see, you know, like we only see what's right in front of us. And so sometimes we need those people to, to call us out and to call us higher. The third thing I would say is follow peace, like let peace be your answer. There are a lot of times where you feel led to say yes to something that does not make sense. It does not make sense. And it did not align with your plans and with what you wanted for your life. But if God is the leader of it, he will give you the peace to do it. And so I encourage you like follow peace, follow peace, follow peace. And then the last thing I would say is pray first. I am a big believer of prayer and honestly could do a whole podcast on it because I believe, man, there's so much power in prayer. And so for me, every single step of the way for three months leading up to saying yes to going on The Bachelor, I prayed and fasted constantly. I had my people praying for me. And then all throughout the show, I had seven people that I reached out to before I went on the bachelor. And I said, Hey, I know this is going to be really, really, really hard. I need you to pray for me. I need you to, I need to know you will commit to praying for me every single day that I'm gone on the show. And I had those seven people praying for me the entire time. And then every day I was on the show, even if it was like a two minute little prayer in the bathroom, I prayed, I stayed praying. The Bible says pray continuously. Like we can't stop praying. That prayer is that constant communion with God. That's how we stay connected to God. And I think sometimes prayer for people is like really weird. It's like, what do I say to God? <laughs> how do I talk to God? Do I, do I stare at the wall? Do I, you know, twiddle my thumbs? Do I act like I'm on the phone? Like I'm talking to somebody, like, how do I pray? And man, it's just, it's just a conversation. It's just a conversation. You pray, you talk to God, and then you listen you listen, you let them speak to you. And I'm not even saying that's like this audible voice, like, hello, you are to go. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. It's like a lot of times it's, it's just like, you know, there's something that is just like laid on your heart where you just feel, you feel this urge, you feel this peace, you feel this word, or there's a verse that's laid on your heart. Or sometimes God will speak through people. But my encouragement is pray first. One of my favorite verses is Matthew 6, 33. And it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. And so my encouragement would be to you, like pray first, pray first, pray continuously, never stop praying and, you know, have people around you that also can pray for you and don't try and do it alone. Invite in wise counsel, invite in accountability, invite in people who love God and who love you and who want what's best for you. There are so many pressures out there, y'all. There are so many mixed messages. There are so many things, so many moments and ways that we could compromise. We can change who we are. We can cave. We can conform to even like the culture around us and what everybody else is doing. Or we could stay true. We could stay true to who we were called and created to be. And until we do that, there will always be a longing in our hearts for something more. And I guarantee you, if you've had moments of regret, if you've had moments of like, dang, I wish I would have stayed true, it's because you knew there was more for you. And so my encouragement is God wants abundantly more for you, and it is so worth it. It may not be easy, and it may not be popular. It may come with some suffering. It may come with some misunderstanding. It may come with some persecution. But I promise you, walking in God's will, walking in God's peace is the best decision you will ever make. And so with all of the pressures, with all of the, all of the temptations, I just believe in you guys. Like if you've never heard that from anyone, I want you to know I believe in you. I know that God has abundantly more for you. And this is 
also just the beginning to all of these conversations. It's hard to, you know, cover the entire bachelor journey in one episode. This one's pretty long. Um, so if you've made it this far, good job, proud. Uh, but anyways, as always, guys, let me know what you want to hear. Let me know what encouraged you. Let me know what challenged you. Uh, we have an Instagram account, Stay True Podcast. Um, so be sure to follow for, um, you know, just to be able to, to send the DMs and say, this is what I want to hear next. And uh, and just for some inside scoop and some information and just for upcoming um, next podcast. So you can follow us at Stay True Podcast. I'm so proud of you guys. I love you. I believe in you. And as always, stay true. Stay you. I love you. Yeah.